Good morning, everyone. I would first like to thank the organizers of this wonderful conference. It's already been a huge success, and I'm very excited to be a part of such a distinguished group of researchers and scholars from so many different countries. I would also like to thank Richard Zettler, who way back in 2013 asked me to investigate the cattle from the Royal Cemetery of Ur and started me on this very long journey down the rabbit hole. Finally, I'd like to thank Sir Leonard Woolley, who in his eternal wisdom and foresight thought to take care and prepare some animal specimens from the graves in the Royal Cemetery. I'm forever grateful that they have been preserved so that I and future scholars can study these magnificent specimens from an even more magnificent place. Now let's see if this works. Right. Today's presentation on the cattle of Ur is part of a much larger research project exploring past human and animal and environment relationships using modern scientific techniques. Mobile Economies investigates early third millennium sites in southern Mesopotamia in varying ecological zones, such as marshes, irrigated uh, agricultural land, and steppe landscapes, with a focus on the animal and human remains. Our research on the cattle from Ur and their isotopic signatures has just been published, as you can see. This is our um, shameless um, introduction. So let's take a look at the cattle from Ur and see what they actually are showing us. Ur's urban nature means that there was a wide range of statuses, professions, and values represented among its human and animal populations. And Ur is Euphrates based, but it's also near the rich resource zone of the marshes, suggesting several different microenvironments adjacent to the city. There's a significant faunal sample available in the UK from Woolley's excavations in the 1920s and 30s, specifically in relation to the Royal Cemetery. Our initial specific aim was to identify the degree of similarity and or variability in the diet, water consumption, and mobility patterns of the cattle found in two distinct contexts at the early dynastic three or the royal and private, non-royal graves. It might be expected that the animals in the royal graves had a more nutritious diet in comparison to the private and non-royal animals, given that cattle offered to the gods are described as having been specifically barley fattened and physically perfect. And you can see here is a picture of the royal cemetery with um, not only the royal graves, but also the multiple private graves that are interdispersed within the area. <clears throat> the original question posed by Richard Zettler was, how did the cattle die? Long discussions ensued on the many theories posed by scholars trying to determine the cause of death of the cattle, specifically for the royal burials. Suggestions ranged from a blunt or even sharp force to the head. The possibility that cattle had been given a liquid substance, possibly arsenic or poison, to either quickly or slowly have them die. Another suggestion was that the cattle, once positioned, had their throats cut. Scientific studies up to this point have not yet been able to figure this question out but I'll get to this a little later in the talk. I just wanna um, show you at the top, there is one of the specimens from the royal grave in this area right here, that's one of the cattle, as well as its radiograph on the left of that, where you can see um, almost nothing except for a very large mass of um, smashed bone. Additionally, questions have been raised as to the role in life and in death of the cattle found in the royal tomb. Scholars who have studied the text have suggested that the domestic cattle were originally used as burial gifts that were slaughtered as sacrificial animals by the deceased king for the banquet. In other literary contexts, cattle were interpreted as draft animals 
After the brief examination, and I will discuss this more um, later in the talk, there has been no evidence of traction or cut marks to prove or disprove these theories. Perhaps the cattle were simply used for conspicuous consumption during the burial practice or placed in the chamber to be used for the afterlife. Suggestions are also made that these animals were reared differently from birth and fattened with a special diet. If this was the case, perhaps it was possible to test this theory and determine if in fact there was a special royal herd that was managed differently. According to Pollock, different differences among the burials can be attributed to distinctions among, among different households, regardless of the temple or palace institutional ties. The tombs then do not necessarily represent competition between temple and palace, but rather an intra-elite competition within society itself. A lapis lazuli cylinder seal, as you can see, inscribed with the name Huabi, comes from the royal tomb 800. So the question is, did the royal households have access to a different group of animals to eat and also to have them in their burials so that they stood out from other elite populations? In order to answer some of these questions, I needed to look at Woolley's animal bone assemblages curated in London. The cattle and most of the comparative material from Orr came from the British Museum in 1919 and 1927 to 30. What was shipped were four cattle heads and related skeletal elements and an incomplete selection of species from various private graves and other contexts. The collection was subsequently divided between the British Museum, which included PG 800, Puabi's grave, and PG 789, the King's grave, and a collection of species from non-royal graves and other contexts that were curated in the Museum of Natural History. Grave determinations, royal or, private slash non-royal, were based on Woolley's 1934 publication of the graves and his own designations. Bonnell remains for all the contexts were studied and identified to species or genus level, skeletal element, sex, age, pathologies, cultural modifications, and taphonomic indicators. Well-preserved cattle teeth were then selected for further scientific analyses. Well-preserved cattle teeth were selected for analysis of their enamel for oxygen, carbon, and strontium analyses. Specimens chosen, chosen included molars from the cattle at the British Museum and the Natural History Museum, and it totaled eight specimens. Strontium was tested for the biological baseline, while carbon was to determine plant diet and oxygen for assessing watering strategies for the cattle. Results from this suite of techniques informed on grazing environments, mobility, and animal management strategies. It's also worth noting that um, there are ongoing studies right now that I'm doing um, regarding proteomics and zoomS to look at the much more specific diet that these animals uh, were fed, as well as the specific breeds of the animals. Samples included from the teeth of the royal graves were three from private grave 789 or the king's grave and one from PG 800 Puavi's grave. Samples of four cattle from the non-royal burial context were also tested, including one each from the above PG 1054, unknown PG, PG 15, and PG 144. And you can see a picture of what the isotope uh, process looks like when you were collecting the samples on your right hand side. <clears throat> this is a bivariate plot of individual cattle which displays each specimen and their carbon and oxygen data. So what exactly are the similarities and differences? The enamel oxygen data are on the horizontal x-axis 
while the carbon enamel data are represented along the vertical y-axis. When we look at this figure, it is clear that there are two separate herd management strategies for all the cattle samples. We can see that the royal graves in red are clustered in two different regions, and the same can be said for the non-royal private graves in green. These patterns suggest that there are varied management strategies for the cattle and that they are eating and drinking in different locations. This means that there is not one monolithic management strategy for all the cattle. And it further suggests that there is not a separate and distinct management strategy for the royal herd and one for the private non-royal graves. So this begs the question, which cattle from the graves have similar management patterns? There we go. The results from the British Museum cattle, those associated with the royal graves, show clearly different diets between the two between the graves. The animals from P, the animal from PG 800 sample A in blue from the table on the left has a C3 dominated diet with no obvious seasonal variation. In contrast to this, the two oxen from PG789 had a C3 dominated diet, and that is samples B and C, again seen in the table on the left. The pattern of the difference between the two graves is also highlighted in the oxygen, as seen in the oxygen data from PG sample, again in the blue on the right, it had noticeably enriched values suggesting the water is more likely to have come from evaporated surface waters than for the PG789, indicating the animals had, again, access to different water sources. Results from the comparative samples from the Natural History Museum, which are the private non-royal graves, also show dietary differences between the different animals. Again, with one animal displaying a C4 dominated diet, and HM2, the upper line on the left table, while the others were largely fed a C3 plant diet. The oxygen isotopes on the right are also variable and largely enriched, suggesting again a variety of water sources exposed to the effect of evaporation is possible to see on these graphs. Oxygen values and diet variability suggest that the animals were drinking from variable water sources and not from groundwater such as wells. At least two types of water sources were found, which suggests that the young animals were coming from a variety of areas within the city's hinterland and were brought to Ur and then lived in Ur under similar water regimes as young adults before being given away as grave goods. The enable carbon isotope data also indicate a range of domestic cattle diets with some animals displaying a predominantly C3 plant-based diet and others a predominantly C4 plant-based diet. What is clear from the results of the carbon analysis is essentially the animal from grave 800, Puabi's grave, was not raised under the same conditions as both of the oxen from the king's grave, 789. Further results from NHM show that the one cattle specimen, number two, was also not raised under the same conditions as the other three oxen from comparative material. So let's take a closer look. In Mesopotamia, cattle, typically Bos Taurus, were exploited mainly for dairy products, manure, and traction, for both plowing and transport, and less often for meat. Holloway's ancient tracks suggest that cattle mainly moved only short journeys from cities to source water and fodder and back, two sources of water and fodder and back, the degree to which 
the cattle were moved long distances within Mesopotamia is unknown. But zooarchaeological evidence shows that some were moved very long distances from other regions. The enamel oxygen isotope data indicate variable exploitation of plant and water so sources, and this suggests a multifaceted approach to moving cattle within and possibly beyond the city hinterland to find acceptable watering and grazing lands. Tooth enamel strontium isotope ratios reflect a local geology as strontium enters the food chain from soils and waters. Strontium varies in rocks of different ages and of different types and can thus be used as a tracer of movement of animals across landscapes with different bedrock geology. The signature of bioavailable strontium in southern Mesopotamia is poorly characterized. So we ended up analyzing 12 mollusks from third millennium contexts at Ur and Abu Salabik to determine their local ratios, since they provide data on local waters to compare to data for herded animals ingesting plants and water from the region. And this is essentially um, the exposed formations in southern Mesopotamia that we were exposing our data to. <clears throat> the scatter plot on the right of cattle enamel carbonates of carbon and oxygen isotope values are separated by individual different shapes and the royal and private non-royal graves, which are in the green and the red. You can see there's strontium values from humans, sheep, goat, shell, plants, and soils in order to get our database. Red or mean royal, green or non-royal. As Ur is located in the large alluvial basin of the lower Tigris-Euphrates river system, the local soils will have an homogenized signal that is produced by the mixing of the bedrock parent material during erosion and transport from elsewhere in the catchment. As such, little variation in tooth enamel for strontium is expected in animals that were raised in any proximity to Ur and only transported long distances to cities could be expected to be displayed via different strontium signatures. The enamel strontium isotope data are consistent with both royal and private non-royal cattle at Ur being raised on the southern Mesopotamian alluvial plain, with no indication of movement between isotopically different settings on a seasonal basis within the early years of their lives. However, from a closer look, strontium isotope evidence, the one on the left, the table on the left, shows that at least one cow was moved to Ur from beyond the alluvial plain, indicating that the animals were not all locally raised and suggests one comes from afar, possibly from the north or east regions, but certainly not internationally in locations such as the Indus Valley. The isotope data articulates the varied sort resources and microenvironments near the southern Mesopotamian cities. We have suggestions of animal mobility, particularly the movement of animals from the hinterlands into the cities. We can also identify herding strategies that pastured animals in the area that avoided competition with farmland. Demand for land of all types of ha was high, with increased urbanism and city-state competition in the early dynastic period. Flexible herd management strategies, including avoidance of farmland and the use of non-optimal plants as fodder, helped. Oops, sorry. I just lost my spot. Flexible herd management strategies, including avoidance of farmland and the use of non-optimal plants as fodder, help to overcome the challenges of seasonal shortages and space demand. So now that we know how the animals were managed, can we see a separation of cattle according to the status of the individuals buried within the graves? <clears throat>
The question still remains how much of the material was made for the deposition in the tombs and how much had use and meaning in daily life and only later was deposited in the tombs. Did the royal people buried in the tombs own and use the objects that were buried with them during their lifetime? The lavish grave goods and death pits certainly indicate that the royal figures had access and control over elite objects and material. But to what extent do the cattle reflect their daily life is potentially hard to determine. Let's take a closer look at the cattle from these graves. PG789 is identified as royal, given the quantity and quality of grave goods in attendance. Animals include six oxen harnessed to two carts of different sizes, positioned near the ramp and suggesting these were among the last items to be added to the grave. Close-up images of two in-situ cattle cranium and an image of the entire cattle specimen on the right-hand side show that there is a question um, that can be answered potentially on how these animals were killed. Note the way that the ox at the top, uh, sorry, at the bottom of the uh, right-hand side is oriented with its legs almost tucked in like it was lying down when it died. Also, human, 44 appears to be crushed under the weight of one of the oxen in the region circled. Woolley describes in his publications his removal of the oxen heads and wrapping them in paraffin wax and bandages for export to the UK. Here's one of the specimens still wrapped in those actual bandages. X-rays helped us to determine the location of the teeth, as you can see up in the top left, um, for aging and to locate which teeth would be chosen for the isotope studies. As such, we were able to age this ox, like the previous ones, into uh, late subadult, early adult, with a rough age of three years old. There were some vertebrae attached to this animal which did not exhibit any evidence of butchered marks no matter how hard I tried to find them. Hence, at least at the juncture of the vertebral column, uh, there is no evidence of slaughter. A third ox was sampled, was the most intact of the three, with the actual full mandible and maxilla present, in addition to the entire cranium. Again, the age of the animal was placed at approximately three years of age. There's a large remnant of the copper collar still under the bandages with similar decoration as the ox I just spoke of. I would like to point out that there is a ceramic goblet and you can see the small inset that was shoved up in the inside of the animal's mouth, suggestive of a liquid that was probably given to this animal before the time of death. PG 800 or Queen Puavi's grave is one of the most famous in the cemetery for both the amount of associated wealth and dead attendants. Woolley describes one of these animals as lying again on its side, suggestive of a sleeping or relaxed position with its copper collar well preserved. This one is now at the British Museum. As you can see in the picture, there's a large decorated copper harness that is connected with the animal from PG 800. It was possible to determine the age of the animal at around three years. This relatively young animal means that it was not a discard, discard animal and that it was already heavily used for traction in the fields. There was also no visible evidence for any pathologies on the mandible, teeth, or metapodial, which supports the suggestion that this particular animal was part of the death pit assemblage and a valuable conspicuous consumption item. It is possible also that they were placed there for the queen to use in her afterlife, but this animal was not food since it was clearly harnessed. 
sorry, just trying, there we go. While Woolley's Fauna collections, both in the Natural History Museum and the British Museum, are the two largest assemblages from the early excavations, the fauna remains from the private graves is only a very small percentage of the total animal grave goods within the thousands of burials. The remains are also representative of what Woolley chose to ship home and hence potentially biased and not necessarily wholly demonstrative of consumptual, consumption or ritual patterns of disposal. In any case, let's take a look at the material from the graves to see how different or similar they are, both the cattle and the other animals found specifically within the private non-royal graves. According to Woolley, a random selection of animal parts, especially crania and teeth, were exported to the UK. As a result, the frequencies here are a product of export bias, and they represent what Woolley chose to export, and therefore this assemblage cannot necessarily represent the full range of species that were found in these graves. This assemblage, however, is clearly representative of the animals that are found in the surrounding landscape. It's interesting that the caprines, sheep and goat, have the highest frequency over cattle, which would have been expensive as grave goods. There is no species that shout high status from any of the private graves, except for possibly the uh, evidence of fish vertebrae, specifically shark. Further analyses on the body portions of these animals suggested a wider range of skeletal elements that is indicative of the whole animal being deposited in the grave. Hence, a whole animal is expensive and therefore perhaps these were grave goods for the non-royal population in lieu of expense material remains. Based on the traditional zooarchaeological analyses observed, we can, uh, from the two different collections, we can see that with the royal graves, what we can state is that all of the cattle from the graves were killed in their prime, sub-adult, aged three, and not older animals that were already used for the fields for traction. This is clearly for conspicuous consumption purposes. In regards to the private graves, Grave species identifications determine no evidence of high status animals, but high frequencies of domestic herded animals, as well as much lower frequencies of pig, fish, and gazelle. These remains are utilitarian, and the whole animals were potentially deposited as grave goods. Observation and implications include gaining an understanding of the general diet and status based on the ages of the cattle from the royal tombs and the private graves, insofar as they chose prime animals for use in the royal tombs, and there was little evidence of conspicuous consumption in the way of species representation. Management of animals across the landscape indicated by the isotope data suggests that we can, it can better be understood as a dynamic process where treatment of the cattle from the royal graves is not unique from those in the private graves. They are moving the animals around the landscape, different places to water and feed animals, and the presence of one animal that moved from farther afield indicates that there was some long distance movement of animals, and it's notable that this animal was from a royal grave. Despite the implications of texts, at least two different herding managed herding regimes were found in the royal herd data, which likely made use of the local alluvial plain and potentials of the irrigation system. The patterns observed in these data suggest flexible management strategies at Ur, and that the animals ended up in all types of royal graves in the royal cemetery and were not kept separately during their lifetime. These observations have already begun to challenge our long-standing theories on herd management and mobility, which will enable us to carefully take a look at both the textual document documentation as well as the zooarchaeological information. <laughs>
And that is it. Apologies for going over a little. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, extraordinarily interesting uh, talk. Thank you very much for all that detail. Um, so um, we do have, I think, a little time for some questions. Um, and um, one's come through actually from uh, Professor uh, Catherine Twiss, who oh, okay. um, asks around, um, here we are, do you have species IDs on the fish? The, uh, the excellent question. Yes, we do. Um, there, there is both marine and freshwater. Um, the uh, we we have evidence of uh, tuna and uh, river river Nile perch, as well as, like I said, the um, the evidence which was shocking of um, the small Persian Gulf sharks that had come up. Uh, the the estuaries are up the Euphrates into um, the region. Great, thank you. And um, uh, just a reminder to um, everyone in our audience, please do use the Q and A button if you have any questions, and then I can relay them to our speaker. And perhaps I can just take advantage of being here to ask a question myself. So, where are I? Are you thinking that poison is the answer? Uh, <laughs> so, you know, that, that is one of the eternal questions. And again, um, when Richard Zettler posed the question to me and I looked at the radiographs, I was hoping that I could see some sort of evidence of a massive um, pick to the head, if you will, or some sort of blunt force. But it was just shattered because of the weight of the soil. It had shattered all of the uh, cranium. And so, um, again, I looked for the cut marks on the neck to see which would have been horribly messy if they had done that in the actual tombs. Um, and so there was no indication that that happened. Plus, all of the lying um, down indicates potentially that they were poisoned because we have evidence and, you know, I didn't have time to talk about it, but we have evidence of one of the cattle that has its legs, they're broken off. So they were standing, the feet were standing up and their, their um, femurs were broken, which suggests that they literally fell over because they had their harnesses still on, whereas other ones are lying down. So, um, and I couldn't find anything um, about the goblet that you were um, asking about until I went back and I had taken all these pictures. I apparently was examining a very clean specimen, whereas the original specimen that came in, which is the one I showed you, had a goblet shoved up into its mouth. And um, so then the pieces sort of um, began to be put together. I know that um, Sally Fletcher, at the British Museum at that time, um, they did, they took the goblet out and they tried to do uh, different studies to see about the, what the material was in there. Uh, and they didn't end up having any results. And because it would have been ingested at the moment almost of death, it wouldn't, it wasn't over a long period of time. So there'd be no evidence in the animal either. So, but I think it's a pretty, they would have had to have sedated these animals. Um, otherwise, you know, I don't think they would have killed them, you know, with blood and gore if this you have this lavish ceremony. But it might suggest the same was true for the people, um, resurrecting Woolley's original idea. Right, right, exactly. And we just have uh, time for um, uh, one more question, which is uh, around... What is C3 and C4 plant diet? So C3 and C4 plant diets are just, um, they are different types of plants. There's wet plants and there's dry plants. And so they are found um, in differing areas. So C4 plants might be the, the reeds and the marshes where the C3 plants might be the, the cereals, the wheat and the barley. So they're just two different 
categories of trying to examine um, the differences in plants and diet. And they, they present a different um, isotopic signature. Well, Athena, thank you very much indeed for that uh, stimulating uh, talk. Uh, we look okay. forward to all uh, the future work that will emerge uh, from yes. this very much indeed. So, so thank you again. My pleasure.